You shouldn't have come back, Flynn. You realize I can't allow this? Now, how are you going to run the universe if you can't even answer a few unsolvable problems? You know, you don't look a thing like your pictures. I'm warning you. Welcome to the last Movie Outpost celebration of movies from 1982. This week, Tron. Tron follows the story of Flynn, a computer software engineer who was formerly employed at Encom, a huge software company. He now lives and works in a video arcade since he was pushed out of Encom by another software engineer called Dillinger, a man who stole his game ideas and got rich off them and took over the company. Flynn tries to hack into Encom to find the files that prove that the games were his, but he gets stopped by a master control program, an AI that was designed by Dillinger. With the help of his friends, Alan and Laura, who both still work at Encom, they try to find the files. The MCP knows that Flynn is trying to break in, and manages to trap Flynn in cyberspace, where the programs appear like the users that created them. Inside cyberspace, Flynn learns that the MCP and its second-in-command, Sark, rule and coerce the programs to give up their faith in the users. Any programs that do not follow the rules end up in the games where they will most likely be killed off. Flynn meets Ram and Tron, so they can find the files that Flynn is looking for and bring down the MCP and Dillinger. When Tron came out, it was one of the most cutting-edge movies ever made. In 1982, computers were just starting to get powerful enough to make even the most basic of graphics. One of the computers that was used to make the computer graphic imagery in Tron had 2 megabyte of RAM and 330 megabyte of hard disk space. To put that into terms you might understand, there are a thousand megabytes in a gigabyte. Your phone, which you probably have, has about 6 gigabytes of RAM. So here is a graph showing you the average mobile phone processing power compared to that of the original computer. The movie famously stars Jeff Bridges, Bruce Box Etner, Cindy Morgan, Bernard Hughes, Dan Shaw, and the late great David Warner. Originally, Flynn was to have a more comic tone, and Robin Williams was considered for the role. As the script developed, the comedy was toned down, but Flynn still had a sense of humor. Now that is a big door. The director, Steven Leisberger, was an animator and an artist who first saw Pong on a computer in 1976. He was fascinated about how it worked, even with the simple images back then. He had the idea about bringing those visuals to the big screen. Leisberger owned a studio with his business partner, Donald Kirshner, and they had been making Batlick animations that were all the rage in the 70s and 80s. Here is some of his early work that he used to advertise a local radio station. WCOZ. The name Tron simply comes from the word electronic. Tron was a character created by Leisberger to show off his company. A simple outline of a main hero with Batlick animation and two spinning discs as weapons. Both Leisberger and Kirshner started pursuing a story, one like Alice in Wonderland, in which a young girl gets lost in a fantasy world, but in this movie, it would have a human that entered the cyber world inside a computer. Originally, the movie was to be an animation, using the Batlick technique, but a computer scientist, Alan Kay, read about it and convinced them that it should be a live-action movie instead of just hand-drawn animation. Alan Kay would later go on to be the inspiration for the character Alan in the movie. Leisberger wrote the script with Bonnie McBard, and eventually they had a script, storyboards, and some of the initial visuals in place. So they reached out to some computer companies to finance the film. No one was interested, until Richard Taylor of Information International showed interest. They had everything in place. All they needed now was a major movie studio to produce and complete the finance. They approached companies like Warner Brothers, MGM, Columbia Pictures, but they all turned them down. But it was Disney that actually showed an interest. 
Back in the day, Disney was known for taking risks and interested in making more daring productions. They agreed to finance the longer test footage, a scene involving the Flying Dish Championships. The footage had a mix of live action, backlit animation and computer generated scenery and when the scene was shown, the movie was going to be made. Tron went into production in 1981. It was one of the first movies to ever use computer generated images and had four companies working at the same time to finish the footage for the film. Back then the computers could not handle animation so each frame had to be individually produced some of the more complex scenes taking up to six hours to render a single frame of footage. Originally, inside cyberspace was going to be completely white, much like George Lucas's THX 1138, but it was found that it needed far too much light to light a single scene. In the end, it was decided that shooting on a black background was better. This also helped with some of the computer graphics, since black could be put over any parts where the graphics weren't very good. The motto of the movie became, when in doubt, black it out. For the backlit effect, the original footage was shot, then rotoscoped onto large film frames that were then broken down so each of the components could be individually filled. Some of the more simple scenes needed about seven layers, some of the more complicated ones up to 200 layers. The way they were working meant the schedule would have taken around five years to complete the film, but they found a company in Taiwan called Cuckoo's Nest that could do it much faster than them. The first set of frames were sent over and then all hand drawn by a team of painters and sent back. When they opened the boxes and started to carefully take out the finished frames to photograph them for the finished scenes, it turned out that the company in Taiwan didn't let the frames dry properly, so many of the frames were stuck together and completely useless. This was corrected, but the other problem they had is that some of the film would glitch and let more light in where it was needed. It turned out that the film was being cut down and then being used in the wrong order, causing noticeable flashes. They figured out that they needed to use the film in the correct order to cut down on most of the glitches. Ones that did stay would simply have a sound effect over the top of it, so it seemed like part of the cyber world. Lisberger had a thing about having all of the latest video arcade machines around the set, so the actors and crew could play games in between filming. The set was littered with all of the latest video games. You can imagine all the cast and crew, uh, you know, wanting to rally them to get back to work. And they say, well, wait, 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 just one second, you know, and that was often the case. And Steven was often right in there too, you know. The movie also contains a few little Easter eggs, like Pac-Man, Mickey Mouse, and at Alan's desk can be seen a small poster containing the words, Klaatu Narara Nikto. The music for Tron was written by Wendy Carlos, best known for making her music in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining and A Clockwork Orange. She had a unique mix of analog Moog synthesizer and a Crumb Mars GDS digital synthesizer. It created a futuristic music score, much like you would have made in cyberspace. On July the 9th in 1982, Tron was released in the US and Canada and grossed around $33 million dollars in total, it made about 50 million worldwide. In fact, it was Disney's highest grossing live action movie for five years. The critical response overall for Tron was great. Most of the critics praised the visual effects, but also noticed how human the story was. It also inspired people like John Lasseter, head of Pixar and Disney Animation Group, who also saw the potential of what computers and filmmaking could do. He once stated, without Tron, there would be no Toy Story. Jeff Bridges, who plays Flynn, said he's had a lot of luck working with new directors and was intrigued by the entire concept of the movie. Bruce Boxigner wasn't sure about the film. He was better known for making westerns, not for something like Tron, which was a science fiction. Peter O'Toole was originally going to play Dillinger, but when he visited the set expecting to see the large solar sail built, and then he learned that it was all going to be made inside a computer, he didn't quite understand and turned it down. The movie needed a good bad guy, and Hollywood had a thing about casting British people as the baddies, so they cast David Warner. He was very well known at the time and everyone was pleased to have him on board. He gave a performance that is one of his fans' favourites. Oh boy. 
In 2010, the movie had a sequel in Tron Legacy, directed by Joseph Kohinski. It picked up 30 years after the original movie, where Flynn had become stuck in cyberspace, leaving his son in the real world. Personally, I liked the sequel and thought it was a good solid effort. Now nah, this I can do. But it did split the fans a little. One thing the sequel did have was the electronic musical score, which was famously done by Daft Punk. What I'm talking about. Tron is a great movie. It broke boundaries of technology and kick-started the whole CGI revolution. Interestingly, the movie was never nominated for an Oscar for the special effects, since the Academy deemed that using computers was cheating. Imagine that going down today. Tron left its mark on the cinema landscape and inspired many filmmakers to use technology and inspired many kids to stretch their imaginations. The special effects in Tron, by today's standards, do look a little dated, but when you appreciate all the effort that went into making it, you can appreciate how good Tron is. With great storytelling, great acting, and special effects at the time that blew people away. Well, that's another of our movies that we're celebrating from the year 1982. You can check our YouTube channel for some of the others. In the meantime, head to the last movie outpost for all of your movie news, reviews, and everything cool about films. Cute. End of line.